introduce you to David Tebbett, affectionately known as Tebo to his friends and colleagues. Uh, David has been a journalist and an analyst for probably more years than I've been alive um, and uh, started his career selling newspapers on the streets of Paris. This is true, but I don't tell anybody that. Thank you. <laughs> I'll drop you in it in a minute. This is Alison. Alison's a big cheese in a PR company. She's Marcom's whiz, has been for about 17 years, and her little dirty secret is that she thinks that she's still an 80s disco queen. I and am an 80s disco queen. Who am I to argue? Now, the point of these, this set of videos is that um, Tom Frensky, you may not have heard of him, but you can look him up. You could, he's probably on Wikipedia, Frensky. He says that every company is a media company now. And I don't think you can argue with that. And I think a lot of, a lot of people uh, reach their publics, reach their stakeholders through journalists, and that's fine. Um, I've got to say that because I am a journalist, but no, it's true, and Alison's PR, so you know, even more reason um, to want to do it through the media. Um, but some people want to get stuff out there quickly, or they want their spokespeople to become na names, recognised, trustworthy, all that kind of stuff. So they have to write directly um, for their publics uh, without going through the media. So we're going to be talking about business writing and the writing will then be either published or, or yeah, by a third party, which is good because it gives uh, credibility, or by their own company, which can be good as long as they learn to, you know, the people learn to trust them. Um, or, or it can be used in speeches and that kind of thing. So business writing is absolutely a focus. And Alison is now going to ask me some grotty questions. I don't know what they are yet. And let's see how we get on with that, answering them. Number one. So what would you say is the most important thing um, when anyone's writing any kind of article? If there was one thing that you, one piece of advice you would give, what is it? One piece of advice, okay. Know your reader and what they will value. Is that one or is that two? You can get away with it. All right, thank you very much. So that's, that's, that's the main thing. You, uh, if you don't know the reader, you cannot begin to focus. So you're, you're, you're floundering right from the word go. I would say you've also got to know your subject because if you don't know your subject, you can't write in the first place. That's, that really is two now, isn't it? <laughs> um, know what gives them value. Whiffed. Now, I've never heard anybody say whiffed before. It's but whiffed? Well, I've just said it, haven't I? What's in it for me? Ah! Oh, whiffed. I thought that was whiffing. Well, I. how can it be whiffing? Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, okay. Ah, I know why I said whiffed, and I'm going to stick to it. What's in it for them? You have to know what's in it for them. So, whiffed triumphs. It does. Well done. <laughs> Please the reader. important when you're writing articles? Well I would say be enthusiastic because if you're not enthusiastic about the subject why should anybody else be and it's you're often given something you really don't want to do but do you know what once you start researching it you find that you you get to quite like the subject you get interested in it and then you end up you get enthusiastic anyway this is what I've found it's very rare that I've been given something to write where yeah, even if I've groaned in the first place, you know, please do us a piece on marketing analytics and uh, Christmas. And you think, oh my God, why should I do that? And then you start investigating marketing analytics at Christmas and it's really quite interesting. In fact, I did do that um, end of last year. So research is, is, is very important. Um, you've got to make what it is, you, 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 you make it interesting for the reader. Well, of course, if you've gone through that loop of, of research and getting interested, then you will be able to make it interesting. I, I think you really don't want to fake it. Do you know? Try and find somebody else, if, if, or, or maybe even interview somebody else who is enthusiastic about it. That's quite a good way of getting around the fake it issue. But if you do try and fake it, people will, will, will know. They will, they will spot it a mile off. Um, you also have to match the reader in terms of their, um, their, their knowledge level, really, their, their vocabulary, the vocabulary they use. 
and and the tone and the tone really depends on the subject matter you know I mean if you're writing about the death of somebody you, you know you're going to take a somber tone if you're talking about a marriage it will be possibly joyful <laughs> possibly <laughs> well yeah possibly I mean not all man- marriages are joyful I think some are sort of convenient but uh, let's not go there that's eh? another subject for another day it is really isn't it thank you Alison that was well played Ah, oh, now, there's a question. Can anyone write? Can anyone write effectively? I shall just add an effectively on the end of that. And my answer to that is if they can talk effectively, if they can go into a business meeting and articulate themselves clearly, then they can write. Uh, writing is just really speaking down your arm and out your fingers, isn't it? Uh, it doesn't matter whether the words are exactly right or this and that. If you, if you just hammer away and, and, and you write, you can always go back and look at it and, and sort it out. And it's not like when you speak. When you speak, you speak and that's it. It's mm. like us sitting here. Um, there is no editing. You just gotta, you know, you live with whatever you've done. Whereas with writing, you, you've got that second chance of going back and, and, and sorting it all out. Mm. So there is a bit of dis- discipline, but broadly, if you can speak, you can write. You can write. That's okay. my view. That's my humble opinion. So let's think about media for a minute. Do different types of media put um, different demands on business writers? Yes, because, crikey, there are so many different medias these days. Mm. If you look at tweets, 140 characters, that's not very long, is it? But it's still, it's still a medium, or, uh, or it is still media, take your pick. Uh, blogs, a bit longer. Uh, news, features, they they all they all differ in length. They all differ in um, intensity. You know, news is get in there, get it written down, get out, and just leave the reader with the essentials. A feature writer can explore a bit more deeply, and th- then you got you you got on. Well, I've already said it really, but you've got online and offline. If 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 it's online, it's generally shorter and you need to be a bit more concise, otherwise people won't read to the end. And God, some uh, online titles have like five pages for one article and they throw ads at you as you turn each page. Nobody turns the page. I doubt if they finish reading the first page, to be honest. I shouldn't really say that because I write for one of those. (laughs) 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 Um, So uh, uh, paper is different. Paper. You, you have the advantage that the, the, the pages are spread out in front of the reader, they see the headline, they see pictures, they see pull quotes. This is where you put a quote in, big bold letters in the middle, um, uh, illustrations, uh, crossheads, all that kind of stuff. You, c- you can do a lot more. And, and the headlines, if, if it's online, then the search engine has got to find the headline. Whereas if it's on paper, you can be a bit clever. You can have a silly headline and, and get away with it because it amuses the reader. And so, yeah, you ask if different media have placed different demands. Yes, they do. And Something's just occurred to me. Uh Language and vocabulary. Like, what's your view on the type of of vocab you should be using for business writing? I think it depends on the destination. If I were writing for The Guardian, which I've done many times, uh, I, I, I write in a particular way. It's reasonably friendly, reasonably amiable. I don't aim for snooty words or anything. I'll just try and speak the way people speak. Mm -hmm. Um, If I'm writing for the Financial Times, which I've done, it's kind of different. It's a bit more po-faced. It's a bit more, well, business-like, really. So if it's a business paper, well, you did ask about business writing, Mm -hmm. didn't you? So I think if you, you, you just got to think about the reader. If you think about the reader and you communicate in the way that you believe that reader will accept your words. Look, I used to write for the Director magazine. Um, I was their IT correspondent for years. And when, when the editor first met me, he said, who do you think our readers are? I said, captains of industry. He said, you're wrong. I said, what? He said, they're not captains of industry. They're just the people you see at the annual uh, Directors, the IOD event in uh, Albert Hall or wherever it is. Uh, no, our readers are 
uh, one-man bands, usually call themselves management consultants, estate agents, and Midlands manufacturers of refrigeration equipment, 200 employees. Now, if you keep those three people in mind when you're writing, you'll be spot on. And you know, that's how it works. Yeah, that helps. That does. Good. So how do you grab and keep the reader's interest? Well, you grab it by entering their world, I would say, right at the beginning. You, you, you enter their world because you know who they are, hopefully. If you don't know who they are, you better find out quick. And then you go into their world and you think about their needs, their interests, and you hook them that way. And you hook them by, obviously, headline and such like. But let's get beyond the headline. Um, the first paragraph, you want to make your sentences short. They've got to be absolutely pointed towards the, the needs and interests of that reader. Um, and you want to make the, the early paragraph short as well. We're not talking about news, um, new, news items here. We're talking about features, let's say, or, or opinion pieces. So if you keep your paragraphs punchy and your sentences punchy, by the way, a sentence is a thought and a paragraph is a theme, if that helps you. So you don't want to go mixing themes in one paragraph or jumbling up multiple thoughts in one sentence. That's a bit of an aside, but um, if you can surprise the readers, intrigue them, um, hold out some kind of promise that this article is really going to be worthwhile, they'll hang in there. Now, it depends then on the length of, of the piece. If it's a short piece, then you probably won't have much problem sustaining their interest. But if it's a long piece, like a feature, of two or three thousand words let's say you have got to drop nuggets in all the way through that piece and the way we we, we write we tend to write as a pyramid I don't know if I've, uh, if you're familiar with this the um, the pyramid way of writing but you, you you know your essential point you build it out with evidence you answer the questions that you expect the reader is going to need answers to and then you move on to another one so don't don't fire all your bullets out the out the gun right at the beginning um, save them, and I said nuggets before, now I'm saying bullets, but it's the same thing. Um, save, save some, so that you, you sprinkle them all the way through the article and then wrap up nicely at the end and, and, and gather your thoughts together. That's what I would say. So tell me, what are the main slip-ups that writers make? Well, I, I have to confess, I'm I, I'm uh, I'm sort of obsessed. Uh, I'm obsessed with get away. Yeah, yeah. I'm obsessed with spelling. Nothing drives me more insane than bad spelling. Uh, and and I notice it more and more these days as younger and younger people come into the into the business. And so, my understanding is when they're at school, they're encouraged to be articulate without worrying too much about spelling. And I can see the point of view, I can see it very well. Um, but what I can't see is when you go into a search engine, <laughs> you're looking for something and you can't spell it, then you might not find it. Or alternatively, if you've written something and it's badly spelled and somebody is looking for you in a search engine, they might not find what you've written. So that is, that is just um, a, bit of a, a bit of an obsession and uh, I confess. But there, there are other things, you know, that was, that was the main slip-up, spelling. I mean, it's easy enough to fix, for goodness sake. You know, you, you can... Well, the trouble is you can't trust the computer. You can trust the computer up to a point, but you still need to read stuff. I'll come on to that some other time. Um, but you, you don't totally trust... I, I saw a thing the other day. I misread it, unfortunately. It's, I thought it said a daft law. And it didn't, it said a draft law, but you know what, they may as well have misspelled it because it's the sort of thing that would slip past a computer spell checker. So if you wrote a daft law, the spell checker would go, oh yes. <laughs> and it's not until it's published and you see it should have been a draft law and you're terribly confused and embarrassed and the rest of it. Anyway, that's, that spelling is one thing. The other thing I would say is be active. If you know what a verb is and if you know what a subject is, shove them up the front of your sentence. And if you don't know, well, you need to find out. Um, the girl, that's the subject. Et, the, the, that's the verb. The apple, that's the object. Not the apple was eaten by the girl. I mean, this is a really stupid example, but a lot of people, especially bureaucrats, want to be 
a bit passive. They seem to feel more comfortable uh, with passive forms. So they would. I, I would say that they're the main the main um, things that people so probably get wrong. Be direct. Be direct. Yes. Active language. Active language. Okay. Thank you. So, what are the common slip-ups are there? A lot of people like to use common cliches. See that a lot. Yep. Uh, and some even not so common cliches. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, like, it's a no-brainer. That, that's not a particularly recent one, but it is a lot more recent. Than, <laughs> uh, well, it's certainly a, a, a late 20th century one. Total no-brainer. Don't 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 use that. Uh, business jargon. Some of this makes me laugh. I mean, some. I was I was, I was um, editing somebody's website this morning, and they were bragging about the fact that they were Web 2.0. And I thought, well, what is the point? You know, that 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 is already out of date. Uh, Web 2.0 was quite a long time ago, and and there's really no point. Another one I love, and do you know what? This is very, very common. It's 24 by 7 by 365. I don't know if you do sums, but that's seven years, isn't it? 24 by 7 by 365. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I went on Google just to see how many people did this. One and a half million hits. I went for the more accurate 24 by 7 by 52. 14,000 hits. Does that make me wrong? <laughs> it drives me nuts. So business jargon, don't, well, jargon and cliches, if, 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 it's, if it's commonly said, don't say it because you may as well use your own words and, and be original and be respected for being original rather than being seen as some tired old hack. Adverbs, adverbs. These are words that are used to decorate things. So, she smiled happily. She's doing it now. <laughs> is there any other way? Maybe there is. But wouldn't it be grimaced if somebody did something different? I don't know. You don't need the happily, it's not necessary. So, you, lots of words end in L-Y. Now, I'm not saying they're all the adverbs in the world end in L-Y, but, you know, if things end in L-Y and they're stuck onto a verb, there's a very good chance it's, a, it's an adverb and it's not necessary. Uh, you've got to be sensitive these days. You've got to be sensitive to race. You've got to be sensitive to gender. And I think you probably know that. But it's very easy to slip into um, the wrong form of words. If... If you were talking about a day in the life of a university student, you could imagine slipping into, and he would go down the shops for coffee, or something like that. I don't know if you'd say that, but I like the accent. You, <laughs> you could you could say uh, university students tend to go down the the the, the, the cafe uh, down the shops for coffee, or they because you already know that you're talking about university students, they go down the shops for coffee every morning or whatever. I mean, it's a really stupid example. But you see, you can, you can, you can get away from the he and she um, by moving to they. So have you got any practical tips on where to start writing an article? Know your subject. You, you know what I'm going to say next, don't you? Know your reader. You're well on your way. If you know your subject and you know your reader, sit down, hammer away. Don't worry about anything. Just hammer away. Don't worry if you're using cliches or jargon or misspelling or anything else. Just hammer away. Get your thoughts out there. You can always sort it out later on. Once you've done it, once you've exhausted yourself and you've written as much as you can write, now read through it. You will see gaps, you will see repetitions, you will see omissions, you'll see all sorts of stuff. So just make marks all the way through wherever you need to do something. Don't do it, because if you do it at that moment, 
you, you'll kind of get in a muddle. Just make marks, say more needed here, move this, chop this out, that kind of thing, just go through it. Once you've gone through it, then actually deal with it. So you, you fill in the gaps and um, you move stuff. If you've got something, you're looking for flow. If you, if you can get the article to flow from start to end without anything getting in the way, what you might find is now and again, there is something that gets in the way, but it's actually important. So think about doing it as a box out. Think about maybe just having a little panel on the page that explains that particular bit. And then that way you don't interrupt the flow, but you do, you do keep the important stuff in there. Then you, f you finish it um, by topping and tailing it. So you write an introduction, you write a conclusion, you can write a headline if you like, but chances are nobody will pin print it. Well, unless you're in control. If you're, if you're in control, you can print whatever headlines you like. Um, so that, that's how I would that's how I'd approach it. There there is a later stage, um, which is called sort of proofing, which we talk about separately. I think. So anything else before you submit? Before you submit, yeah. If you get the chance, sleep on it. When I have a busy day, sometimes I, I write stuff. And I go off and have a nap. Once I've, once I've done the first draft, I slide off and I go to sleep for 10 minutes and I come back to it and I see it differently. And that, that always happens. Mm -hmm. So, um, but normal people, I don't count myself in that category, normal people will sleep on it overnight if they get the chance. Then you iron out anything, you look for wrinkles, anything that um, you don't like the look of, change it. And change it the instant you see it, because these are going to be small things. And, and if you read through and get to the end, you'll have forgotten whatever it was. So if you can, just iron it out as you go along. If you're worried about your spelling, what I would suggest is that you find somebody over 40, who possibly who went to a grammar school, um, because they're more likely to be spelling aware than uh, if you're very young. But I don't want to insult you, because your spelling might be brilliant. I'm just saying if, right? Are you invisible? That's another question to ask yourself. If you're writing, a, if you're writing a, an opinion piece, of course you don't need to be invisible. But if you're writing a feature or a piece of news, then you don't want to be in it. You, you just write a piece and nobody needs to know who wrote it. They might know from your style, but that's another thing. Now, once you've, once you've finished, I would suggest that you read your piece backwards, sentence by sentence, from the very end. You will be astonished at how many things you pick up doing that. Because when you're reading forward, you know what's coming next, and your mind sort of takes care of it, and you don't notice gaps and omissions. But if you read it backwards, you spot things that you wouldn't have spotted otherwise. So, that's about it, really. Good luck. <laughs>